the president of ELSA alumni. I was elected uh, in the margins of the Opatia ICM in November 2018. And uh, the reason I stood, a group of us got together and we just saw immense, uh, uh, immense potential for the ELSA alumni network. If you think that ELSA has been around for about 40 years now, next year it'll be 40 years. If you take all the active people who are in that network for, for, for in the ELSA network, it's just an amazing group of people year after year that come together. And so our dream is to bring that community together, to make it, to bring it to life, to provide the infrastructure to enable uh, uh, alumni of ELSA to come together uh, and, to, uh, and to be part of this community. Uh, and so, 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 so what, what we've done is we've created ELSA alumni, you can have a look at our website, and there are four pillars, four foundations to ELSA alumni. One is what we call the, the community pillar, and that is just bringing together this, this amazing community of inv individuals who are from all over the world, different countries, different generations, different backgrounds, different interests, just bring that unique diversity of people together. together. That's the first pillar. The second is the professional development pillar. If you think that we've got all these alumni from different generations, different backgrounds, we can really work together, help one another together, grow our careers, enhance our knowledge, grow our business opportunities, we can all do that as part of this same community, this, this, privileged, this privileged community that we are. And I think today is a great example of how we can help one another learn and grow and develop as, as individuals. So that's the second pillar is, is, is professional development. The third is, is support to ELSA, giving back, giving back to the organization from which we came, the, the organization that I, sh I think shaped all of us in so many incredible ways. We might, we might want to give back to ELSA, support ELSA, support the next talent of leaders that are coming out of ELSA. It's a great opportunity to give back to ELSA. And the fourth reason we created ELSA alumni was to keep on building a, a just world. Uh, to, collectively together, we can do amazing things. If there's just a group of 20 or 30 of us, Maybe not so much, but if we build a really truly amazing network, we can do uh, something amazing together and support the activities uh, of ELSA in promoting a, a just world. So that's what I wanted to give uh, by way of introduction. Thank you again for, for, for joining the, the, the webinar today. I hope you will join ELSA alumni. I hope you will, will contribute to the, the, the vision and mission of this organization and that you'll get something out of it for yourselves as well. Uh, not just today, but as a, as a valued member of the ELSA Alumni Network. So that, Stephanie, is all I wanted to say at this stage. Thank, thanks very much for, for letting me say a few words, and I'm also happy to take questions once the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the presentations are done. Thank you, Patrick, for this introduction. And again, welcome, everyone. My name is Stephanie of Statiu, and I'm an alternative dispute resolution lawyer and IP lawyer based here in Munich. I am also an ELSA alumni myself with a very active ELSA career, which happily concluded by becoming an ITP trainer now for ELSA, and I will be your moderator today. Thank you for joining us in this first webinar of ELSA alumni career series, a series of webinars which we aim to host in order to give young alumni an insight or on um, the career making of fellow alumni from the last days of their law school, until today and provide them with tips and perspectives on how to make their own. Before introducing our speakers, I would like to mention that after the presentations and informal interview questions I have prepared myself, there is going to be a Q&A session by the participants. The participants will either have the opportunity to raise their hand with the raising hand function, as I believe is on the um, dashboard below or in the functions that are in the dashboard below. And our invisible technical support angels, Denise and Robert, will unmute and unblock your camera so that you can pose your questions. Another way is to write the question in the chat box and then I will pose it to the speakers. After the conclusion of the overall session, Robert and Denise will share some inf final information about ELSA alumni and the services provided. 
last detail before we start. This webinar will be recorded so that ELSA alumni can create an online library of the webinars. The recording will exclude the audience Q&A. So, with that being said, Careers Beyond Borders, how to make a career outside your home country is our topic today. And I am delighted to present to you our speakers who represent three different and exciting career paths a person with a law degree can pursue. So as our first speaker, we have Diana Constantinidou, who is a barrister specializing in international criminal law and human rights in London, UK, and is a YouTuber as well. Welcome, Diana. Hello, hello. I had to unmute me first. Thank you so much for the invitation, Stephanie, and to all the participants here. It's an absolute pleasure to be part of, uh, of this webinar. Thank you so much for the introduction. If you could um, give us a short introduction on your career path before moving on to the next speaker. Of course, yes. So, um, as Stephanie said, my name is Tana Gosandinido. I'm a barrister, but I'm also a CIPRA qualified lawyer. I did my law degree in the UK. I did my master's in international commercial law. I did my legal practice course. I qualified in Cyprus. I'm a member of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators. And then I did my bar transfer test. Whilst I was practicing in Cyprus, I had my own practice for four years. At the age of 24, I was heading the litigation department. Uh, it was an amazing experience, but I can give you all my ins and outs about it, uh, whether you should be taking such an opportunity or not. Uh, and uh, I've learned a lot out of it. Uh, soon after, I left Cyprus and I came to UK and I pursued my bar here in the UK by specializing in international criminal law and human rights. And now I am representing genocide victims before the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and I'm advising NGOs about the various human rights uh, violations that different states can have in regards to their statute crimes. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you. Our second speaker is coming from the business sector and is Bettina Cooperman, who is a business development director at iTicket Global. Hello, Bettina. Hi, thanks for having me. Could you also summarize, uh, give us a short career summary? Yeah, it's going to sound a little bit stupid after Di Diana, because <laughs> I've spent the last 15 years working in the sports and entertainment industry. Uh, I got my LLM from Copenhagen University. And during my, my master's degree there, I spent a lot of time at the business school in Copenhagen, where I was also lecturing in sports law and sports economics. And that took me into the world of international sports. I ended up in Switzerland, in Lausanne, where all the international sports federations are based and spent three years there, mainly focusing on sports politics. I'll get into that a bit later. Um, after three years there, I was a bit tired of Switzerland and needed a challenge. So I went to Turkey. I went to Istanbul and I opened up uh, the office for the company I was working for in uh, Istanbul, left that and opened my own business uh, and have been uh, working in, uh, yeah, as a business owner and um, uh, doing business brokering in various fields for the past 10 years. Thank you very much. Anything to add? If none, um, then uh, last but not least, our final speaker for today is Tommaso Andrea, who is the first councillor at the permanent representation of Italy to the EU in Brussels. Hello, Tommaso. Hello, very nice to, to see you. Unfortunately, I don't see the, <coughs> the attendees, but I'm, I'm very happy to have been invited to this, this event. My career path has been a little bit more sort of classical uh, public service, uh, public sector uh, part. Uh, I joined it uh, after my degree, I actually worked in ELSA. I was a secretary general of ELSA in 86. Then I studied uh, for joining the Itali Italian diplomatic service, which I joined in the end in 1999. And uh, I've been working in the ministry or for Italy for the last 20, more than 20 years uh, with uh, <clears throat> postings in Rome, uh, in uh, headquarters, but also uh, in Norway two times and in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and since uh, 2017 uh, in Brussels, the Italian uh, investigation of the EU. 
and, and it, it's it's the the topic of the seminar is also very interesting because one of my areas of responsibility in the mission is also to uh, coordinate the support for Italian uh, officials in the EU institutions. So, uh, and if that is everything to have to support the uh, career advancement of our economy nationals, but also replying to questions by interested people who want to join the EU and want to know how to do it and uh, what kind of courses to do. So this is, I think uh, we have also good understanding on what, what are the expectations in a way uh, for, Italians, but I think this is a general concept for those who want to join the EU and work in the institution, be it the Commission, the Council, the Parliament, or other more sectorial ones. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So now, beginning with our um, first speaker, Diana, uh, I believe you have a presentation to show. Indeed, I do. And I found it very helpful, actually, when I am participating, I'm one of the attendees to when there is a presentation. So I thought it's only wise for me to apply what I would enjoy to, to, to be. So here we go. Um, allow me just to share my screen. Just bear with me. Now, as I say it, my name is Sana Gosanida. I am a barrister and I'm going to share with you my take on the how to cross your borders. And slideshow from beginning, here we go. Can we see the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm more than happy to connect with you. I'm very active on social media. As, uh, as Stephanie said, I do uh, create YouTube content, legal YouTube content, uh, whereby I share tips about how to become an international lawyer and various other things. So you can go and check that out. Now, I'm sharing with you here how to become an international lawyer and five strategic steps and beyond that I distill through my practice, through my humble practice. I do practice law at 33 Bedford Road Chambers and um, let's get started. Now, first of all, you need to keep an open mind. You need to, it's our minds are like umbrellas. When we keep our, our minds open, we're able to welcome and accommodate views and takes on when it comes into our career that perhaps is not there for us, maybe is not very clear. And I'm saying that because a lot of times we're trying to copy and to see what other people did. But when it comes into expanding your borders, when it's about pursuing an international practice, it is about being liberal and it's about finding what's true to you. You have to find what is unique about you. And that will be your marketing, uh, your marketing material, because each and every one of us would possess a unique, um, a unique skill. And I'm saying that because when I was very little, I was taught by my pianist teacher. Uh, for those that you don't know, uh, La Gambanella, it is a song from Leeds, and you can actually Google it and check it out. It is one of the most difficult pieces that has been ever written by piano. And actually the composer, um, he thought of actually preparing a, a piece, a music piece, which is very close to God. Uh, so no humankind can actually play it. But nevertheless, there are pianists today that they able not just to play the song, but to be able to put their own twist on it. And I'm saying that because once you start, when you are a law student, or even if you're trying to pursue an international career, how many times have we, all of us, not just the attendees, but also us, the participants, we have heard that it is difficult, it is quite challenging, you have a lot of rejections. We keep hearing that, and sometimes I'm not amused by it, I do say to myself. But what I'm here to say is that it is possible. Even the most difficult careers, even the ones that you believe that is too far from your reach, it is possible. And it is possible if you remain focused. And how do we remain focused? It's by knowing what we want to do. So for personally, uh, for me, I started by having my own practice in Cyprus. I was a lawyer in Cyprus. And soon I realized that um, I wanted something more than that. And I realized that because um, it is something deeper than just about studying law. It is about identifying what is that that you want to do with your life. Because we all have to live a life that we're proud for. And I decided that what I want to do, the way that I want to live my life and practice my profession is the way that I contribute to the community, to the world. And I decided that the best way to do that is by practicing international criminal law and human rights. But that journey, that internal journey, it is so personal that each and every one of us has to go and has to answer those questions that it is for you to give answers. And I'm afraid there is no manual to it. 
So there is an internal journey that you have to embark upon. And it is truly fascinating because there is no manual to it. And you're going to be the one who's going to be able to give solutions. So when I had my own practice, it is th that was the one skill that I possessed is about identifying and crystallizing what was my true passion. Because ultimately, passion is what makes things revolve around, is what makes the spark being there and it what makes us to remain composed articulators and to be able to succeed in what we want to do. Now, um, when it comes into very practical steps as to how you want to do it, so more tangible, uh, perhaps guidance as to what you do, you have to somehow select a legal discipline. Now, it may be that that's not the one that you're going to end up doing. I was doing civil litigation. I've done bankruptcy. I've done debt collections. I've done landlord and tenants. Even today, my practice in the UK is be quite, be quite um, a mix. Um, and that's because um, you have to keep that balance. International law, it's an investment that you make in order to get to the point, which I'm going to be speaking purely about international legal advocacy. So that means that you find yourself advocating before the international tribunals, speaking before those tribunals. So that takes time. You have to invest on yourself. You have to invest on your profile. You have to conceptualize your international profile. And you're going to be able to do that if you start from somewhere. There is a point A. And the point A is that you select a legal discipline. It could be migration law. It could be family law. There is always an international element that you can elaborate upon it. But by starting by selecting a discipline that you believe is closer to you and you enjoy doing. By saying that, for me, family law, I knew it when I was practicing in Cyprus and I've done a bit in the UK. It's not my thing uh, for a number of reasons, but I know it's not something I want to touch upon. I, at least I've identified that. And it takes a bit of courage to be able to say, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm going to pick on. And I knew for a fact that family law is not one of them. So feel free to kind of write down what is that that you feel comfortable with and just kind of knock out, struck out areas of law that you're not um, confident that you want to, to deal with. Okay, so as Stephanie said, we all somehow we have to possess a law degree. That is the starting point. That will be, um, I always said the law degree is like a black uh, cloth. It can it can take and you can fit it with different things. Uh, an accessory that makes it look a bit different. You can uh, wear different shoes. I know it sounds a very, a very woman approach to it, uh, but nevertheless, you have to have a law degree. But with that law degree itself, it is very blunt. You have to, um, you have to touch upon it experience. And Elsa is one of those experiences. Elsa, it is, the, it is the tunnel that's going to allow you towards that window that's going to open you the world because Elsa somehow it is a reflection of the world. I'm not suggesting by any means that Elsa it is the only organization that's going to allow you to enhance your curriculum activities, but it's at least one of those examples, one of those great examples. So you have to explore what is that that you want to do that has not yet been done because it's not just about doing a profession is not just about being a lawyer, but it's about contributing to the world that it, we are contributing towards something positively. No matter what the area of law is, I've chosen for me personally to be international human rights because it's closer to who I am. Um, but it, there is so many other things that you can definitely um, uh, explore. Now, the third step, the third guidance that I will, I get, and this is something I get um, asked a lot, do I start domestic or do I go international? My personal view on it, and uh, there may be some lawyers that may disagree with me, but I, I'm here to share my personal experience of this. I feel that it is the crux of a great international lawyer is the one that understands the domestic principles. International law has its substance on domestic principles. If you're not able to comprehend, let's say, civil procedurals, how they work in practice by using what you have around you. I'm saying that's because I was in Cyprus, I attended Cyprus court many times, I've appeared before the courts in Cyprus many times, and it definitely allows me to see now, for example, criminal procedurals, whether it is Cyprus or UK, I can do a comparative analysis, and I see the ICC regulations when it comes into, uh, into the um, procedurals, how all that kind of falls into place. So it's a beautiful puzzle that you can create by using all this experience 
domestic. Use what you have. Use the power that enables you from your home jurisdiction. And as I said, and I may reiterate this, but I am a truly and um, I'm a true believer that we have to do what we love. And to know what we love, we have to do the internal journey. You have to identify something that you're passionate for and you love for. Because you don't want to be at the age of 16 thinking, what did I do with my life? You need to do something and be proud for. And being a lawyer, it gives you that tool. It gives you that powerful tool to do what is that that you want to be. Um, this presentation, surprisingly enough, um, it was prepared a long time ago. And I have here artificial intelligence and law. And today, as we're speaking in light of COVID-19, and perhaps it is a homework that we, we all have to take with us, what do we take from these problematic times with us? And as lawyers, what can we do? Um, um, at least for human rights aspects, we see that a lot of uh, states, a lot of countries have been using the measures themselves for human rights violations. We have seen that at uh, this time, it is a very problematic time. We can see there's a 49% increase in domestic violence incidents in the UK. And I'm sure as soon as those measures, the lockdowns have been lifted, I'm going to be before the magistrates and the Crown Court dealing with domestic cases. So what is that that we can take with us? So perhaps it's not just artificial intelligence, it could be what do we take with us from COVID-19? I am open to collaborations. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me. I love to speak to you. If we share common vision and grounds, I'll be very happy to speak to you. You can find me on Instagram, on YouTube, and uh, just leave me a message. Thank you so, so much, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Diana, for this very insightful presentation. Thank and you so much. Moving on to uh, informal interview questions now. Um, I would like to ask you, first of all, what was the one or two things that you would like to have known before starting your international career? What would it have been? I think the one thing that I would like to know, which will be a blessing and curse, it's the, um, sometimes I, I, I tend to say that I feel that I'm pulling a massive stone by myself. I lift, I pull a massive, a massive stone. It's so heavy that I feel that my, uh, my arms are bleeding or I feel like my, and I'm, it's a metaphorical way that I'm meaning it, in the sense that um, it, it takes definitely uh, a lot of work and that's why I said that this is a journey that speaks by heart um, at least for my profession and at least that's the way that I want to manifest my life but at the same time if I knew that Stephanie perhaps I wouldn't embark on this journey I wouldn't go go on and do it um, and the second thing that's what I would do is to if you know if you found what is that that you want to do and if it's similar to what I'm doing now what I would uh, do is create a plan and say, where do you want to be in 10 years time? Um, and I can say, for example, I know for a fact that I would like to return back to Cyprus. I, will, I have political aspirations. I would like to contribute to my country uh, for a better tomorrow. So what is that I need to do now in order to get to that point? So create a plan and have a clear goal as to what you want to do. It doesn't matter how impossible it sounds like, it's just write it there make it happen we're into this together not just COVID-19 <laughs> <laughs> so first of all have the end goal in sight and then move along with all the other planning definitely okay um do personal relations or um persons that come along your way matter uh, I think that's an excellent question human interaction does have um, an impact uh, on you and it's been uh, psy uh, psychoanalysis and psychology has actually proven that and there are ways that people are able to to um, to affect you um, and that comes again uh, part as to what you want to do for me personally every step of my career I didn't have enough confidence to embark on it um, but I was blessed enough to have people around me to encourage me every time to take on that step um, so people do affect you and it takes a lot of strength to be able for those people that they will uh, lead you towards the opposite direction of pursuing your goals. It takes a lot of strength to tell them, stop. It takes a lot of courage. 
but um, it's something that you have to learn and it's a skill that you learn through your way. And um, I will, I wanted to keep it as general as possible, but as you are qualified in the UK and we know that there's a split system in the profession in the UK, um, solicitors and barristers, what are the differences if you could explain us in short? And I'm sure that this will be also helpful for some participants that will have the, um, the vision to work in the UK. If you could explain us in short what the difference is and maybe also in short how to pursue each path. Oh yes, definitely. So the, um, the British legal system, it is divided in two legal disciplines. We have the first one, you can be a solicitor and the regulatory body is the SRA, Solicitors Regulation Authority. You can go and Google it, write it down, and that's what you want to go and look at. Now, if you see yourself that you want to be in court, that means advocacy at the very top of the court, um, at the Supreme Court, then you have to look into becoming a barrister. You will be on your feet, you will be day in, day out at the court, you're going to be conducting trials, you're going to be doing hearings. And you need to go and check the website of the Bar Council or the Bar Standard Board, BSB. Uh, now, of course, there is an overlap between those two. That means that it doesn't only mean that the barrister goes to the court. We do have solicitors that come to the court as well. So the lower court, that can happen as well. But the main difference is that the solicitor does prepares the pleading, does the conduct in litigation. That's the terminology that has been used, uh, which barristers cannot do. And if you do, you're going to be in breach of your conduct. So you have to be very careful. But that's essentially those two differences. And that's something that uh, practicing in the UK, you have to decide what is that that you want to do? Do you see yourself speaking directly to the lay client? The lay client is the client. Uh, because the barristers, we are instructed by professional clients. We get instructed by the solicitor. So there is no direct, con uh, direct conduct with the clients themselves, um, unless you do what's called direct access scheme. So I am a qualified direct access barrister. So that means I can directly speak to lay clients subject to restrictions. Okay, great, thank you. And if the participants will have any further questions, they can ask it uh, in the Q&A afterwards. Definitely. As to my last question to you, it would be, what were some of the challenges that you had um, during this journey of yours? And what were your key skills to to evolve through these challenges and if Elsa um, helped you with that? Yes, um, so for me, the three skills that they are the crooks, not just about pursuing a career in, in law, but um, being a good lawyer as well. The first skill is to always be prepared. No matter what you decide to do, preparation, it is the crooks of a great lawyer whether it's a solicitor, a barrister, an advocate, you name it. Preparation is key. So I feel that that's number one. Uh, number two, it is about uh, listening skills, is to listen carefully what people have to tell us. Because humans, we tend to dismiss information that we believe they are irrelevant. So as lawyers, we firstly have to overcome the human hurdle about dismissing this information. And I'm saying that through my experience, sometimes uh, when you have a trial of a domestic violence case or you've got GBH grievous bodily harm and the person is telling you, I don't know, about his grandmother and you're telling it's irrelevant. Let's move on because there is a pre time pressure. But if you listen carefully, that tiny detail, it may actually have an impact on your case. So we have to overcome that human hurdle of not just about listening to the information that we believe and perceive to be relevant. So listening skills, I believe it is the second most important skill that uh, someone has to develop. And I've been evolving through this in my career. Um, and number three, it is curiosity, is to be curious to always learn. Um, and it's not just about law, it is about constantly evolving yourself by reading, understanding, reading the news, reading um, different things. And in order to be able to um, to accommodate people from different cultures and upbringings because as a lawyer you have to um, to interact on that level so understanding have a deep understanding about all that it definitely allows you and uh, given my third point uh, Stephanie I would say that Elsa 
allowed me to expand my curiosity by meeting with all these beautiful people that still today I have contacts with. Um, Elsa, I was the president of Elsa Cyprus. I was the person that represented for the official membership in the, in the ICM, the International Council meeting uh, back in 2014. And since then I have maintained beautiful contacts uh, throughout the world. So you, Elsa and Elsa Luna, it is definitely a window of freshness and a window to, to a beautiful world. It is the reflection of the international community. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we are moving now to our second speaker, Bettina. And for you, I would like to start with a question. How did you decide to go from the legal to the business sector? Yeah, um, I think you never actually leave legal. Uh, I think once you are a lawyer, uh, once you've trained your um, approach to solving problems in a, in a legal way, I think that stays with you your entire life. Uh, so it wasn't so much that I went from legal to business, it was more that I think I knew throughout my entire like academic um, career that, that I didn't want to become a traditional lawyer. I knew very early that I wanted to specialize in sports and entertainment and especially sports. Uh, and I focused on that throughout my studies, uh, both my bachelor thesis, my master thesis was on sports. I, um, I, I worked at the business school, as I mentioned before, as a lecturer in sports and then went straight into it. So I think the big thing that happened for me in my career was that when I moved to Turkey, I started sort of continuing the work that I had done in in Switzerland, which was working for another company as a consultant, and suddenly I ended up having my own business. And that was the breaking point in, uh, in, in my life and in my career, because then I suddenly entered a completely different mindset. I was no longer working for someone else. I was uh, establishing my own business. I was growing my own brand, my own uh, I was ha I had staff, you know, I had a lot of responsibilities. I had to secure investments and so on. And I think that was really what um, changed everything for me. But without a law degree, uh, I, I don't think I would have managed, to be honest. What were the skills of uh, your legal background that helped you with all your journey? Um, well, uh, I think... The, the, one of the key skills is, uh, is the analytical mindset. Um, in order to open a business, in order to do the type of work that I've done for my clients, uh, you need to be extremely strategic. And I've done a lot of the work that I do for clients is strategic work and strategic uh, advice. And for that, having a legal background is uh, very, very useful. Um, one of the main things that uh, helped me was um, I took a wonderful course during my master's degree in negotiation skills. And uh, that course and those skills are something that I constantly develop on. Because being in, I think it doesn't matter if we're in, uh, in, in arbitration or if we're in, uh, uh, litigation or if we're in business as I am you are constantly faced with negotiations and being able to present your case whatever it is to present your argument whatever it is this is this is key so I uh, if, if anything um, whatever you become good at remember to add that part to it I couldn't agree more with you actually on that and um... As to my next question, in terms of you being in the sports sector, yeah. how does it feel as an empowered female to be in a world of a still, in my opinion at least, a male dominating sector? Yeah, uh, we joked just before here that we could easily have another webinar just on that topic. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think anyone now, I, we, I can't see who I'm talking to. I can't see if there's a lot of women or, or men sitting, but I think 
no matter what you do. I mean, you, when you make your career choice, you have to be very realistic of what you go into. And obviously going into an industry like sports, I, I wasn't surprised that there weren't a lot of women. And I knew that it was something that I uh, had to be aware of. I think in my, when I was a little bit younger, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't take it, I didn't think so much about it until I actually reached, um, you know, a more, un until I had my own business and until I had to secure my own business and stuff. But um, yes, um, I started before the Me Too movement uh, and uh, I've obviously listened to a lot of things that today people probably wouldn't find acceptable. Um, you shrug it up, you move on, and I, I, I hate to sound cynical about it, but if you want, like, if you want to move ahead in business, and if you want to move ahead in that industry, you have to kind of agree with yourself that some things you just shrug off. Be keep your eyes on the goal, and why should some schmuck ruin it for you because someone passes a, a stupid comment? Uh, so yeah, I mean, definitely it's many times 90% men, 10% women. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also an industry that's very exciting and, and fun. What were other challenges that you faced during your career? Uh, and if I may add, is switching from uh, a law degree or even a, a master's in law um, to business easy? Was it easy for you or was it easy in the beginning and in later stages you found out that it wasn't as you have imagined it? Well, I mean, as, as I mentioned, I, I, I think I quite early realized that I wasn't, I was never really going to use my law degree in that way. Uh, and my first job actually was in consulting. And in consulting, what they do is they take you and then they rip away everything that you know and, and that you learn. And then they build you up again uh, because it's sort of the theory of, you know, get rid of the bad habits and then we give you new ones. And so that was kind of my first work experience. And then obviously the, the big change for me was moving from a country like Denmark and then Switzerland to uh, to this part of the world, Istanbul, Turkey, and then working and specializing in uh, business in emerging markets, uh, meaning like Ukraine, like uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Russia, uh, Middle East. Um, and so here, of course, it's a very different, here it's more about um, it's actually, again, about forgetting a lot of the things you know and believe in and learning how business works here, adapt to how business works here, uh, try and give a little bit of what you think is the right direction. But, but obviously, like you can't come in in a, new, in a different culture and say, now you have to do it the Danish way or you have to do it the, the Swiss way. It doesn't work. Um, so yeah, it was a challenge for me in the beginning to really understand the differences. Uh, but once I became more aware of it and adapted it, it, it became obviously easier to work here. Is it easy to change um, not only two countries from your home jurisdiction to go to another one, but also three like you did? Yeah. I, I think in, it depends, I think, where you are in your life. I mean, I have two small kids now and I don't think, uh, it, I mean, relocating at this point is a very big decision. Whereas in my 20s and in the beginning of my 30s, I was uh, more free to pursue career opportunities and that's what I did. And I was open to go uh, many places. And uh, I probably, if I hadn't met my husband, maybe I would have, gone somewhere else so life and your career choices is not just about you know like where do i want to go what's my my plan it's also what happens in your social life it's also what happens in your family life and that obviously has an impact on your choices and that's okay that's great 
And my last question to you would be again, did Elsa and your Elsa career help you in some way in this journey? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's where it all started. Like, I think the, the, the bug for wanting to go abroad, the, the, the feel, the e easiness of being in an international environment and knowing how different cultures uh, react and how different cultures are, especially working in an industry like sports, which is so international. Like we, we, we actually have council meetings all the time as, as well in sports. So that whole uh, dynamic is, is what I've been doing for the past uh, 15 years. Uh, I'm still very good friends with the, the people I was in the board with. Um, one of them, we had New Year's together. Our kids are friends. So uh, I, I loved my time in Elsa and it helped me immensely. Thank you very much. And now moving on to Tommaso. Um, it is, uh, of course, a very exciting and um, not common, I would say, um, to enter the diplomatic service. And I think everyone is privileged to enter the service. And I would like to ask you, first of all, um, how did it all start? And was it your main goal from the beginning of entering law school or did it just occur to you afterwards? Well, uh, <clears throat> in a way I could say, yes, it was um, my dream from, from the very beginning. Uh, although I've had my moments uh, where I thought maybe it was not a good idea after all because of the uh, knowing people and all this hearing stories. And, but then, uh, <clears throat> Then I basically, I think it was reinforced when I joined the International Board of ELSA, when I moved to Brussels, when I lived with uh, <coughs> friends uh, uh, for, for one year in, in, in the ELSA house, well, I actually married one of my board, uh, board members, so, yeah, so it, it really left an imprint on me. Uh, and the, uh, that, then I was more and more convinced that it was uh, what I wanted to uh, so it's not easy uh, in Italy or in, in any country. I think it's, it's, it's a quite selective, uh, very difficult career path. But uh, in Italy, we have a competitive exam, so I have to prepare for that. And uh, I joined in, and then uh, I'm happy that I, I think it was was a good choice. Uh, it's it's an interesting kind of work. It's never you you never know every day when you go to the office what's going to happen. I mean, you try to plan, but it's it's absolutely impossible. And uh, you need to be very flexible in. Uh, in your day and, uh, and your work and it's uh, and you learn every day and this is I can say it's been a common feature in every of the positions uh, that I've been uh, <clears throat> filling in I mean both in Rome and, and abroad I mean you need, one day is never similar to the, to the to the previous one and to the next one so it's, it's I would recommend it Speaking of uh, preparing, would you uh, recommend someone that has entered um, law school, finished with a law degree, having at least a master's in international public law or to prepare somehow else um, to enter the diplomatic service? Yeah, I would, I would say so. Well, I, I don't know about other countries in Italy. Let's say half of the, uh, half of the diplomats are law, law graduates. They have a law degree. So like around 50% more or less. Or probably a little bit less and the other the other sort of yeah it's a political science and then a, a few of them are economic to evaluate and so these are the three main areas where law is probably uh, the dominant one and the uh, <clears throat> but yes to to, uh, to add up your your skills and your knowledge with uh, in, with some in something with an international flavor is uh, definitely uh, useful and i think it's more useful now than it was maybe even 20 30 years ago where uh, in fact the, the career path that each of us were following were, were very national. I mean, the Erasmus, uh, the Erasmus program was in its early days. When, when I joined the ministry, the Erasmus was, had been around for 13 years. So even going abroad for a semester for a year was not something relatively common at that time, in the 90s. Now it's different and I think it's, uh, if you, even if you, 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 I mean, 
when you were a diplomat, when you work for your government, you work for your country, uh, you should always remember that. But it's good to have a, a also an international awareness, so to say. I mean, I think that one of the key features of this job, this profession is the fact that you need to be understanding of, of the differences. You cannot expect others to think like you, and you're actually supposed to try and understand the reasons of the other side, wherever you are, be it in a, in a, working in an embassy, working in a consulate, when you have to relate to from angry parents who want to see their kids to police authorities who don't want to let you see the prisoner of your country, which was detained, in a, or even when you have to speak to lawyers which are trained in a different system. and they. Uh, so it, it is a, you really have to have a kind of elasticity in the mind uh, that I think, that of course, you can train it and then in the career you, you definitely learn. I mean, uh, you cannot be an ambassador uh, in the second day at work. You, you, you need to build up experience and uh, knowledge and you have to have a variety of positions. Uh, to, there is a process. You're ready for that. Yeah, there mm -hmm. definitely there is a process. Um, as you mentioned before, that you are also um, responsible for the ones that come in the EU to work or um, would like to work in the EU. As I myself had at some point a career ambassador um, position for EPSO, which is the European Personnel <laughs> Selection Office. And for the ones that are interested in pursuing a career in the EU, could you maybe wrap up some key features or some key knowledge that they should have? Well, uh, the, from my position is relatively comfortable because if we were, Italy is the country which normally sends the most applicants to EPSO, uh, both in terms of application and in terms of actually success in the completion of the, uh, of the, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, the exam. So normally our work is relatively easy because of the numbers. But in, in any case, uh, <clears throat> what, what I could say is that, well, uh, the tests are changing as far as we know. This is something that is not yet public knowledge, but I mean, I can share it with Elsa friends. Uh, so you will go back to a more uh, sort of academic, apparently, but it's not decided yet, but I mean, these are the reflections because the current system based on uh, tests, admission tests, or, um, like mathemat logical, analytical, mathematical tests has not proven to be probably the most affected because you were selected but uh, apparently this is I mean the feedback we have the institutions are not always happy with the quality of those who pass the exam because they are, can be very clever in this uh, color, colorful balls they have to all these two things but the abstract that, test. yeah the abstract uh, yes. thinking but they can uh, not probably not able to write and more and more importantly uh, some of them do not have very good uh, teamwork skills and uh, working in the, in the EU uh, I think probably the fundamental uh, feature that one person should have is to be able to relate itself to a different to work in a multinational environment because uh, yes, we are trained differently and uh, we, we carry our education baggage with us even if we can be as open-minded as we want but we are, we've been nurtured in our culture and uh, we always have to have the humbleness to not to believe that your culture your way of doing things is the best way you, you can learn from others and the others also you you have lot to give or you also have a lot to get and i think this is uh, i think the key the key advice that i could give to to people strengthen your, your skills to strengthen your multinational experience somehow it can be voluntary work can be of course uh, following uh, academic programs uh, outside your home country you can improve your language skills because you need to speak a language that most likely is not your native one and uh, if you want to work in, in the eu in the eu system but also be, be flexible, be ready, be creative. I think that's actually what what will be the, this kind of recipe for success in this kind of complex uh, bureaucracy. Those are very important features and um, uh, and really characteristics that a person should have to succeed in such a career. I think. So thank you for this um, wrap up and thank you um, for the insight. And as I see now that our time is uh, limited, uh, I would suggest that we move on to the Q&A of the attendees. 
and I will ask also some questions um, if uh, some occur in the in the next round. So please um, send us our questions in the Q and A or use the raising hand function if we have any thing like that. I will pause for a few seconds to stop also the recording. <laughs>